All right, so then for the second part, we're gonna talk about projectile motion. All right, so the projectile motion is two-dimensional motion that object undergoes due to Earth's gravity, which means we already have seen a motion due to Earth gravity, we call that free fall. And this is also basically nothing but free fall, but two-dimensional free fall. So technically then two-dimensional free fall, we call it projectile motion, okay? That means if it's a free fall problem, we have to again assume that there's a fixed acceleration. This acceleration then, you can see right, free fall acceleration, which is G, it's constant over the range of the motion and directed downward. That means at any point at, or at any time during our motion, we will assume that acceleration is only gonna be, you know, in a vertical direction, it's only gonna be then, you know, negative 9.8 meter per second square. So also we have to ignore the air resistance because if actually, in, you know, we kind of consider real life, you know, free fall, we cannot ignore, you know, air resistance because it's there. You know, it affects almost every object, even the rod going down even though the size, the shape of the object, right, uh, plays a big role. If you drop a rock and you drop a paper, they're not gonna go hit the ground at the same time. Rock will have no problem almost reaching just the acceleration due to gravity. Well, you know, paper won't because the air resistance affects those two objects differently. So in a way we can say that if you're treating a rock or a, or a ball or something like that, then the effect of air resistance is technically negligible. We're not saying it's not there, we're just saying it's so small that we can neglect it. So that's why negligible just means that, you know, it's small enough that we can completely ignore it. Okay. Now, if we can ignore it, then we can assume that the object gonna have, you know, when it's a projectile motion, right, it's gonna follow a parabolic path. Okay. Now, the difference here is this. The free fall was you have an object and then you let go of the object, right? You drop it. So then it kind of goes straight down. Okay. You can also give it object initial velocity, but it was straight up, right? And it goes straight up and then straight down. This was one dimensional. This was like a one dimensional free fall. One dimensional free fall. Now we're talking about two dimensional free fall. And when we have two dimensional free fall, here's an object. So the object gonna have some kind of parabolic path. That means instead of straight up or straight down, we're always gonna give it some kind of initial velocity such that it goes, you know, basically either like this initial velocity. So this is, we're gonna talk about, this is known as a zero launch angle, you know, let's say projectile. And you can see right parab parabolic motion because then it's gonna go and then fall down like this. Or maybe we can give it some kind of launch angle like this. So let's say there's another initial velocity and it's gonna go like this, but again, parabolic and then come back and hit the ground. And, but you can see the difference here is this. If this is my X initial, well, there's gonna be some X final. That means there's gonna be some horizontal position change as well, along with the vertical position change. Where here, you know, X doesn't change. It's all, only along the Y axis goes up and down. So that's why it's one dimensional free fall. And this is two dimensional free fall. That means it's gonna go like this, away from where you started in both in vertical and in horizontal directions. But there's a little bit difference between how it moves in the X direction and how it moves in the Y direction. Because we're assuming the entire time, the only gravity as the acceleration present in the system. That means acceleration taking into account, let's say X component I hat plus Y component J hat, right? So then acceleration goes like this. There is no acceleration in the X direction and there is negative G acceleration in the Y direction. That means this is for the projectile. Which means that no acceleration in X direction, AX equals zero and negative G acceleration in the Y direction. Now, what does it mean when there is a no acceleration in the X direction? Do you guys remember what we have if there is no acceleration for that, for that direction of motion? Well, it means that this motion along the X direction, right? Or X axis is uniform. But the motion in, along the Y axis then is non-uniform. 
What it means is that in the x direction, once let's say you calculate the speed in x direction or a component of the speed in x direction, right, of that initial velocity, it will be constant. Vx is same as V initial x, same as V final x, so it is constant. Why is it constant? Because there is no acceleration in that direction. So motion is uniform. In a y direction though, there is a, you know, acceleration, negative 9.8 meter per second square, which means that any type of velocity in a y direction, whatever you start with, so let's say, see, I take this one, I find the y component of that, well, it's going to decrease, decrease, decrease until it's zero, y is zero, and then it's going to increase, 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 increase as it's going down, because it's going to slow down as it's going up and then increase when it's going down, okay? Because acceleration always down, so if your motion is in the opposite direction of acceleration, you slow down. If your motion is in the direction of acceleration, you speed up. But here, this is, you can see, right, this is why I'm going to take this motion, projectile motion, and break it down into two separate motions. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna completely separate them into horizontal and vertical, okay? I'm gonna say that what I have here is, I have, let's say, um, well, this one doesn't necessarily separate. So this one kind of gives me an equation for uh, how I can find, let's say, this one kind of like in the X direction, this one in the Y direction. So think like this. So let me go back here and maybe do it like this. I'm gonna over here, before we go to the next page, uh, I'm gonna write down what I have for each, let's say, for each dimension, right? Each, each axis. That means Using those two as a guide, I'm talking about these two as a guide, and I can say this, here's X axis and here's Y axis. In the X direction, it's a uniform motion, which means acceleration is zero. Now, acceleration in zero means that no velocity, uh, no, uh, no velocity is constant. So initial velocity is same as final velocity. You can just say some Vx, so it is constant. And only one equation that we could use for the uniform motion, if you remember, that was delta x equals Vx times time. Okay, that means this is that one equation in the x direction, because it's a uniform motion. Uniform motion is just one equation. In a y direction, then what I have here is negative G acceleration, but acceleration is constant, which means I can use the kinematic equations. Equation one, V final in the Y direction equals V initial in the Y direction minus GT. Equation two, V, sorry, Y final equals Y initial plus V initial in the Y minus one half GT squared. This is equation two. Then equation three, V final in the Y square equals V initial in the Y square minus two G delta Y. And you will see right in the Y direction, I'm writing down basically same equations we use for the one dimensional kinematics. And this is correct. So that means we can use it because if I'm breaking down the projectile motion Let's say you kick a soccer ball and the soccer ball goes in a you know, parabolic trajectory. If I'm looking only the Y direction motion, it's just almost basically like same as just going up or down because I'm ignoring you know, horizontal motion. Only vertical motion can be described as almost like you know, same way as the one dimensional free fall. So the last one here is delta Y is equals to V initial in the Y direction plus V final in the Y direction divided by two times time. That means I have these two separate, you know, uh, dimensions, right, X and Y, and I can then use each one to describe projectile motion. And then I can, if I need to at the end, combine them. And one thing that combines them is basically this time, because time is universal for both axes. Okay. So that's why, remember, one thing we can do is 
look at in terms of, let's say, the velocity vector. So here's, let's say, my coordinate system. And imagine, let's say you have an object, I don't know, like a soccer ball sitting here at the origin. And you want it to be um, basically going, you know, let's say projectile motion. So you want it to have a projectile motion. So we, what we do here is we give it a kick. Like let's say we are kicking like this with this initial velocity. And then this kick gonna then make the object go, oh, sorry, make this object go in this trajectory. So it's gonna go like this and then come back and hit the ground. All right. So you can see then what I have here is this object gonna go undergo parabolic motion like that. That's actually trajectory, actually path of the of the ball. Now, what we do from the very beginning is we look at this initial velocity vector and we look at its direction, let me call this theta i, and then I wanna say that, okay, so this is a two-dimensional velocity and I don't wanna work with two-dimensional velocity. What I need to do here is I need to then break it down into X and Y components. And this is gonna be its X component and this is gonna be its Y component initially. And because the theta is given with respect to X axis, then I can say that X component is nothing but the initial velocity magnitude times cosine of launch angle. And then the Y component is equals to initial velocity magnitude times sine of the launch angle. Now think like this, those two equations should be always the first thing you do if you have a projectile motion with, you know, some initial velocity and launch angle given to you. That means assuming that we are given V initial and theta initial, then we can do that. All right, because that's what I have. See, this is X direction motion. Initial velocity in the X is same as initial velocity, uh, final velocity in the X. But how will we find that X component? V initial times cosine of theta initial, just like I have here. And it's gonna be constant, it's not gonna change. How about in a Y direction? Is the final velocity, initial velocities are the same? No, because there's an acceleration in the Y direction, which means velocity initial minus GT will give you then the Y final. And velocity initial is given with V initial sine theta initial. That's kind of what we have, All right? Then this is then that one equation in X direction, how to find X final, and this is how to y find Y final. Um, again, you can see there's no acceleration in X direction, but there's acceleration in the Y direction, right? You can see right up to this point, they're the same, but then there's a, you know, obviously an acceleration in X. Okay. Now here's one thing we can do to understand and you know see how this is a, you know, like let's say um, parabolic, you can combine these two equations by eliminating time and writing down this last equation, right? So this last equation over here, where you replace time with, you know, let's say this quantity. You can see, right, if I rearrange, time is equals to delta x over v, vx, okay, delta x over vx. So if I take that, and plug in over here and over there, that means eliminating time, then what I'm gonna get here is this equation, which there is no time, but Y versus, you know, in terms of X axis, because then if I'm eliminating time, I'm introducing X into that equation. And this tells you that basically, you know, you can see right, there's a parabolic, let's say, uh, information there. That means the motion here is gonna be parabolic like that. Okay, so that's why Looking at this, you can see that, you know, this equation demonstrates that parabolic motion for the projectiles. All right. So here's, let's say that, you know, a diagram that I had. For example, you have a soccer ball at point A, you give it a kick, and then it goes into this trajectory. Just like I said, if you have given initial velocity vector and an initial launch angle, right, you can right away use this, what I call equation one and two for this you know, components, so we say VIX is equals to VI cosine theta I, and then second one, VIY equals VI sine of theta Y. Right away, find the components, which is those two guys. Because see, when you go back and look at all those equations that I showed you, you know, a few, uh, two slides before this, where I broke down your equations 
you can see, right? For X and Y. See what I have here is that this is VX, which is same as V initial X. And then this is V initial Y, V initial Y, V initial Y, V initial Y. You can see right everywhere I have V initial Y. That means I need this V initial Y to be able to use those equations. I need V initial X to solve the other equation for the X direction. That means this should be one of the first things, let's say you need to do in order to be even able to use those equations, find the initial velocities. This graph also very nicely demonstrates this. Acceleration is equals to AX I hat plus AYJ hat. But for the free fall, this is zero I hat minus G J hat, which means like once I calculate this velocity, there is no acceleration to change it. That means at any other time, let's say point B, see the velocity in X is the same. Point C, velocity in X is the same. D, velocity doesn't change. E, velocity doesn't change. They're all the same. Again, because there is no acceleration in that direction. How about vertical velocity? Well, there is a negative acceleration. That means if you have a positive velocity, it's gonna decrease, decrease until it's zero at the highest point. Then on its way down, it's gonna increase and increase because there's a acceleration in the same direction as the motion right now, so velocity will increase, all right? I remember one thing. This, even though I put it somewhere over there, this acceleration is everywhere at any point, at point A, B, C, D, E, doesn't matter which point you're talking about, right? Acceleration, remember, is not proportional to the speed. It's proportional to change in speed, right? Change in velocity. That means sometimes when students say, all right, so the velocity is zero, that means acceleration has to be zero. That's wrong. Velocity, let's say initial is zero, let's say, right? But acceleration is V final minus V initial, right? It's not, does depend on just velocity at one point. It depends on velocity change. So that's why you can have a zero velocity, but you know, also non-zero acceleration at the same instant of time. All right, so these are a couple of equations that you have to be very careful with. So if you start from this point A, and then you go, well, let, let's, uh, okay, so let's say you start from the origin and then you go to point A, and you can even use that. Well, one thing we have here is this. Remember the one dimensional free fall? If you start with some kind of initial velocity in the Y direction, you go in the highest point, remember final velocity is zero. Same thing is true here as well, but final velocity only in the y direction is zero at that point, or you can say velocity at y direct uh, velocity at point A only in you know y direction is zero. But if I do a velocity vector, remember tangent to the, to that path, I have a, actually velocity at point A. But what is velocity is that? Well, that's the general velocity. Remember, this is velocity in A in X plus velocity A in Y. And it just happened to be that that point A is the highest point, highest vertical point, which means this guy here is always zero. But this is not zero because there's an X component. Remember, X component, once I get the X component, it's never changes, right? It's always the same. X component, always constant. So there is an X component. So that means there is a velocity at point A. It just, there is no vertical velocity. So try to remember that important thing. Now, if, for example, you start from the origin or you start from the ground and come back to the ground, that means your you know, initial and your final points are exactly the same. That means you, know, you start from the ground, you come back to the ground. Then you can use this equation over here, which again, like a derived equation, to find how high do you go? Okay, that means this is, you know, assuming that you are using the fact that, you know, your, um, let's say Y initial and Y final, your absolutely last initial and starting start point and end point are exactly the same. Then this equation can give you that because this equation technically then, you know, you can see, right, time independent. That means it's com it combines some of those X and Y axis together to get this equation. Same way, if exactly same condition is true, that means this condition, 
you can then use this equation to find the range, which is horizontal displacement, starting from the origin, how far it will go, let's say. And you can see right this also, technically this range depends on angle theta. Now, one of the things we have, this diagram here shows that technically there's what we call the you know, maximum range. And you can see since R technically is proportional to sine of two theta, we can see that the maximum range can actually be achieved when the sine of theta is technically one and it can be achieved when let's say you are at 45 degrees, okay? Because you know, 45 degrees, you reach that distance. 15 degrees, you reach here. 30 degrees, you reach there. But 45, you reach, I don't know, let's say 270 or something meters. But if you increase above 45, for example, 60, now you come back and get you know, less range. 75, you get even less range and thing like that. That means 45 is the highest maximum, let's say, range you can get. But this is only true if we are neglecting air resistance. If air resistance is not neglected, then this is actually not true. But here we are neglecting air resistance, so that is true. Interesting thing you might actually maybe notice is this, if 15 and 75 give you same range, 30 and 60 give you same range, no. right? So how come, how come those sets give you the same range? Well, what, what, what do you see? Any type of pattern you see that? 15, 75, you combine together, you get 90. 30, 60, combine together, you get 90. Do you guys remember how we, what we call those, you know, where the sum is 90? What do we call that, you know, um, complementary angles, right? So that means, you know, their sum here is gives you 90 degrees. All right. So then let's kind of try to understand how, solve, how we solve this, you know, projectile problems. So first, you know, think about what is going on physically in the problem. You can do like a rough sketch because a lot of times, you know, for example, when I do a problem in class, students kind of, you know, try to memorize the problem. For example, I have a, a I don't know, soccer ball that we give it a kick and it goes and comes back and hits the ground. Okay. And I give you everything that you need to do here is with respect to a soccer ball. But then on the exam, I have instead of soccer ball, there's let's say a cat jumping. So cat jumps and kind of goes like this and comes back to the ground. From my point of view, it's exactly same problem. It's exactly same problem. It's just different objects. Instead of a ball that you kick, it's a you know cat that is jumping. Students get confused. I don't know, you know how to solve a problem with cat jumping, but it's the same thing. So you have an object at the origin and it's you know, either given or gives itself initial velocity and it goes and reaches some height and comes back down. To me, it's exactly the same problem. I can ask you to find the range or I can ask you to find the height or some you know, other information, but it's exactly the same problem because you know, there's not much I can ask you. Like let's say, could be a cat, could be a grasshopper. You know, maybe like let's say, you have a, a cliff and then there's a motorcycle going down. Maybe there's a, a, a ball rolling and then falling down. To me, it's same thing. Maybe let's say a cat jumping instead of like, let's say like this camp jumps like that. Again, same thing. So you have to understand, is this a free fall problem? Is it one dimensional or two dimensional? And then kind of take it from there, right? So have some kind of problem, you know, uh, that's why it's important to understand things conceptually, not just to memorize it. So understand, let's say what's going on, and then uh, confirm that the problem involves a particle in free fall and that the air resistance is neglected. A lot of times you are told to ign ignore air resistance. Then select a coordinate system with X in the horizontal, Y in a vertical. Then, you know, if the initial velocity vector is given, remember right away, you know, find the component, resolve into X and Y components. Then treat horizontal motion and vertical motion independently. Analyze the horizontal motion with the constant velocity model, which means uniform, and then vertical as a non-uniform. And then once you calculate your, and remember, a lot of times you can go back and forth between those, let's say, uh, model, you know, like let's say X and Y coordinates, right? By, you know, finding time in one and then moving that, using that for the other one, or, you know, let's say 
find the time using x, use it for the y, or find the time in y, use it in the x. You can kind of do that. Once you have determined your result, check to see if your answers are consistent with the mental or pictorial representation. That means if you have a cat jumping, right, and it's asking some kind of information, well, cat cannot jump 200 meters, right? So let's say if you get the range. You know, cat maybe jumps, let's say, you know, one meter, two meters, five meters tops maybe. But if you calculate, let's say 500 meters, you'll probably did something wrong. So try to understand, does it make sense, right? If something is jumping, like, right, say a soccer ball, something like that, can they go that far or can that go that high? So that's kind of, you know, what we have. Then let's, you know, start solving problems. So here we're given a soccer ball. So we're gonna basically use this. So we have a football or a soccer ball, football, right? So it's kicked at an angle of initial launch angle theta initial is 37 degrees with a velocity of 20 meter per second, that's shown. So that means we have an object, right? The ball at the, you know, at the origin and it's given some kind of initial velocity which is taken as 20 meter per second its magnitude, 37 degree its um, launch angle. So then what we're gonna do here is we're gonna find the maximum height. So let's kind of like do one by one. So let's find maximum height. What it means is that how high it goes in a vertical direction before it starts falling back down. All right, so, um, so then here's what we can do. Let's say, um, I actually in the next slide. So look at in terms of what's given to us. So you can see, right, we're given the launch angle, 37 degrees. We're given initial velocity, 20 meter per second. We're given that there is no X acceleration and negative G acceleration in the Y direction, okay. And um, for now, one thing we wanna find here is, generally I would like to change it to like, let's say, uh, here's point A, which is the launch point, and let's say here's point B, which is the highest point. So what we wanna know is what is the vertical position of that point B, right? So technically, remember, if I wanna find this height, I wanna find delta Y, how high does it go? It means I wanna find position of B. So what I generally do here is I take position of A in a Y direction, set it to zero, position of A in the X direction, set it to zero. And then use those, as a reference points, right? All right, now, first, first of all, you know, as I mentioned, right, always first thing to do is to find the components. V, let me use a little bit darker, there you go. So V initial in the X, which will be V initial cosine of theta initial, which will be 20 meters per second times cosine of 37. So we should get 16 meters per second then V initial in the Y direction will be V initial sine of theta initial. This will be then 20 meters per second sine of 37. And this should give us 12 meters per second. All right. Then to find, let's say the height, the Y final, right? I have to look at which equation do I use? So remember, I have in the X direction, there is this equation. X final is equals to X initial plus VX times time, right? So that's one equation in the X. In the Y direction, I have V final Y equals V initial Y minus GT. Or Y final equals Y initial plus V initial in the Y direction times time, then minus one half GT square. Then equation three, V final in the Y direction square equals V initial in the Y direction square minus two G then delta Y. Equation four, delta Y is equals to V initial in the Y plus V final in the Y divided by two times time. All right, so Part A is asking, what is Y final? Technically, Y at B, right? What is Y final? Well, obviously, I have to look at one of those vertical equations, set, right? So some one of those in the Y direction. So there is a Y final here in equation two and Y final in equation three, Y final equation four. All right, so three equations where I can use to find Y final. The question is that which one can I use? 
Um, directly, I cannot use two or four. Hopefully you can see why, right? If you look at the table in terms of what I'm given, you can see that I'm not given any information about time. I don't know how long does it take to go from A to B. But equation three doesn't really need time. I can just use equation three without needing time. Now, there are other things I can do. Let's say I can use equation one to solve for the time, then use any of the other equations, but that requires two steps, right? Find time first and then use that to find the height. But I have equation three that I can directly apply, which equation three says V final, which is VB square equals V initial, which is VA square, then minus 2G delta Y. Now, I know one thing that there is no velocity at VB. Remember, this is in terms of Y, Y velocities. And there is no Y velocity at B. Why? Because it's the highest point and there is no vertical velocity at the highest point. It means zero is equals to VAY square minus 2G delta Y. Okay. Then I rearrange, I take then 2G delta Y to the left and then I have VAY squared. Then divide both sides by basically 2G. Then I can get my delta Y. So this will be 20 square, right? 20 meter per second square divided by two times 9.8. And what I will get for the delta Y here is 7.4 meters. Which means that it's gonna go 7.4 meter in a Y direction as a highest point. That means point B is the highest vertical position relative to the ground and it is 7.4 meter above that. All right, so that's part A. Here's then part B. And part B is asking the time of travel before the football hits the ground. So then I'm gonna take this one and call this point C. And I wanna know how long does it take for the ball to go from A to C? All right, so again, number of ways we can do. We can take the equations like for example, I can take this equation one and find the time it takes to go from A to B, which is very easy to do that. And then because A and C have the same vertical positions, I can double that, all right? So that's one thing we can do. So, um, which is very straightforward, right? So if I use that equation, right, V final, which is VB in a Y direction equals VA in a Y direction minus GT, then time will be equals to VA in a Y direction minus VB in a Y direction divided by G, which then will be, you know, since this is zero, will be 20 over 9.8, right? And I'm gonna get um, 1.3 seconds, sorry. I'm gonna get, right, sorry here, I made a mistake. Um, which uh, I also made a mistake here. I just noticed because remember this is vertical velocity and vertical velocity is 12 meter per second. So I have to write 12 meter per second. See the 20 here is the you know, velocity vector itself. But in this equation, I'm using the Y component of that velocity, which is 20 sine of 37, that should be 12 meter per second. So 10 things that here, 12 meters per second, you know, in terms of to do that. So 12 divided by 9.8 gives me one point, roughly one point, uh, let's say 1.24, something like that, seconds. And then I can say that that from A to B, from B to C is exactly the same. So it's double. So the total time will be, you know, two times that which is roughly 2.4 seconds. What do I have? 2.45 seconds. Okay. Now the same thing I could have done also by solving uh, something, you know, a little bit differently here. Okay. By using equation two to solve this, like let's say in one step. So Y final equals Y initial plus V initial times the initial in the y times time minus one half gt square. Well, y final is point c, y initial at point a. But what is point c and point a in the vertical direction? Well, it's zero. 
zero equals zero plus 12 times t minus half of g, so it's 4.9 t squared. Then what I can do here is, I can, you can see, right, it becomes 4.9 t squared is equals to 12 t, move the, you know, this one to the left. Then I can cancel the t like that. And so for time, then t is equals to 12 over 4.9. Okay, so 12 over 4.9, exactly same 2.45 seconds All right that means i could also use this method you know technically find it in you know find the time right using just one equation and it's easy because final and initial positions right were the same so it's zero zero so i don't even end up with quadratic equation All right so that's that's basically the uh the time it takes to go from point a to point c all right so Next question is asking how far away it hits the ground. That means, you know, the horizontal distance from A to C. This is, let's say, part C. Well, it's easy because I have just one equation for the horizontal, which is Vx times time. And I have Vx, right? I just calculated that. Remember, uh, it's constant. Once, I, once you calculate, it's always the same. So 16 meter per second times 2.45 seconds. So you should get roughly, you know, uh, 39 ish. So I get 39.2 meters. Okay, so that's, so that's what I have. On the slide I have 40 meters, but you know, just a rounding thing. So it's pretty much the same. And for part D, it's asking, what is the velocity vector at the maximum height? All right, so remember, velocity vector, that means at point B which is velocity at point B X, you know, or let me do it like this. Not enough space there. So I can do it like this. V at B as a vector should be equals to V at B X I hat plus V at B Y J hat. But we just said that there is no velocity in the Y direction at that point because that point B is the highest point. That means VB is just, you know, VBX I hat plus zero J hat means VB is just basically 16 meter per second I hat. That means it has only horizontal component. That's why you can see, right? It's only in terms of its horizontal component. There's no vertical component. That means at that instant, it's a one dimensional horizontal velocity. All right, so this is that problem here. Let's go to the next one. All right, so this example you can see here is, uh, it, it demonstrates that technically the projectile problems come in two varieties. And let me kind of give you a quick, you know, review of that, overview of that. So in one problem, so it doesn't matter where, maybe underground or maybe on a cliff or whatever it is, but you're given some kind of velocity initial that is at some angle theta i where theta i is greater than zero. So we call this non-zero launch angle, which means that if I'm looking at vix, it's not gonna be then zero and viy is also not gonna be zero. Because remember, there are vi cosine theta, vi sine theta, two non-zero velocities initially. Or you can have a problem where velocity initially is just horizontal. The i is just basically uh, has v i x i hat, but no j hat component. Okay. So here then the object kind of undergoes like this. So here this is the motion, and then here's that's the motion, and this is known as a zero launch angle because initial theta is zero. So then when I'm looking at v i x, this is v i cosine of zero degrees, then equals to v i. But in a y direction, initial velocity is vi sine of zero degrees, which gives you zero. Okay, so that's the difference. That means this first one has initial velocity in the y direction. Second one doesn't have initial velocity in the y direction. And the question is like, let's say, why? How come this one doesn't have? Well, it's simple because we kind of talked about this 
in a previous slide. Remember this point B? Do you see that point B is the highest vertical position this object you know, has the, during the entire motion? And then what did we say about that? Well, there is no velocity at that point. Think like this, if I completely you know, separate this, so think like this, put a wall over here and say, okay, it starts from here. Do you see that then you can say then that's my starting point and it goes horizontally then falls down. So that means at that point, you know, vertical velocity is zero. Yeah, it's basically that's what we have pretty much here. We're saying that object initially moves horizontally on a clip and then when it goes off the cliff at that instant, it has horizontal velocity and only horizontal velocity. That means that's why initial velocity is just in terms of its horizontal component. After that, there's a AX equals zero and AY equals negative G. So this horizontal velocity will be constant, but vertical velocity will change. Okay, so it's gonna like decrease or like let's say increase in a negative direction. You can think of it like that increase in a negative direction. Okay, so that's kind of like important thing to understand about this problem because we have two projectile problems with a zero launch angle and with non-zero launch angle, okay? So the previous example was a non-zero launch angle. So that's why we had initial velocity in X, initial velocity in Y. This one is a zero launch angle, which means there is no initial velocity in a, in a Y direction. See, this, you know, it says, well, first let's read the problem. All right, so movie stunt driver on a motorcycle speeds horizontally off a 50 meter high cliff. How fast must the motorcycle leave the cliff top to land on a level ground below 90 meters from the base of the cliff where the cameras are? Some cameras over there and we wanna, you know, basically record everything. Ignore air resistance. Good, that means it's a free fall problem. All right, so the idea here is this. Initially, this guy, moves like this and then it goes with the horizontal velocity and then undergoes this trajectory. Okay, that means when I'm driving, like let's say what's given to me is this. I'm given that the cliff is 50 meter high. So what I do here is I always take the starting point to be zero, x initial equals y initial equals zero. And that's a t initial, which is also equals to zero. Then Y final, which is basically the ground, will be negative 50 meters. X final, which is to the right of that, will be then 90 meters. Again, AY equals negative G, AX equals zero. Those are the things I'm given. What do I wanna find? Well, I wanna find the initial velocity, VI, the magnitude of the initial velocity. That's why it says, you know, at what should be the, so like, like said the, the speed, right? How fast, how fast it might be moving? What is the speed? So then here's what we do. Remember that equation, right? V initial X equals V initial cosine of theta initial. V initial Y equals V initial sine of theta initial. Now we do recognize that this is a problem with theta initial equals zero. So then if I do that, I can see that this is zero right away because sine of zero is zero and cosine of zero is one. So that means VIX is equals to VI. And remember, this is what I want. That means all I have to do is just find this guy and you know, I have this. And I know how to find this guy because there's the equation. Horizontal displacement is equals to VX times time. And remember VA, VIX is same as VX, it's constant. That means I can solve for Vx by taking displacement in x direction by, by time. And I do have delta x, it's 90 meters. But I'm stuck here because I don't have the time it takes to go from the top of the cliff to the ground. So we're kind of stuck here, but we gave given then a lot of other information for us to find how long does it take. And most of the time, most of the time, to find information about time, you have to use, let's say the y-axis, especially equation two. So this guy, this equation, this is our friend if you wanna find the time. Because think like this, what was the uniqueness about that equation? It was final velocity independent. And we don't know how fast it's moving when it hits the ground. We don't know that. But we have initial velocity in the y direction. Remember that equation goes like this, y final, equals y initial 
plus initial velocity in the y direction times time, then minus one half gt squared. Well, y final is negative 50. y initial is zero. v initial in the y, well, we have that too. That's also zero. That means this entire thing is zero. Then becomes one half, the negative one half, 9.8 t squared. You can see, right? So I can cancel this negatives, then I have then 50 is equals to one half 9.8 and half of 9.8 is just 4.9, right? 4.9 t squared. And you can see, right, it's easy from here. All I have to do is just do 50 over 4.9 and square root. Okay, so this is meters. This is meters per second square. Plug in and calculate. And I should be able to find the, you know, how long does it take? And that's going to be 3.19 seconds. I find that, take it and plug it into here, 3.19 seconds. Then I can do delta x over time and find that this is 28.3 meter per second. So what I found here is Vx. But since I know that Vix equals Vi for this zero launch angle problems, that means Vi is also 28.3 meter per second. And I'm done with my problem. That means it has to be moving at about 28.3 meter per second uh, speed, or maybe like 28.2 probably. So in order, in order to get to that position. There you go. All right. Remember guys, so if you watch these videos and at any point you have any questions, just write them down so you guys can ask me during the class. All right, so here's another example. <clears throat> a projectile is launched from ground level at the top of a cliff, uh, level to the top of a cliff, which is 195 meters away and 135 meters high. If the projectile lands on top of the cliff 6.6 .6 seconds after it is fired, find the initial velocity of the projectile including the magnitude and direction and neglect air resistance. All right, so that means another example where, you know, you kind of have to, you know, realize is this a zero launch angle or non-zero launch angle? And you can clearly see, right, that there is a non-zero launch angle theta. So that means what I have here is initial velocity is then will be VIX I hat plus VIYJ hat. Both of them non-zero, this is why. And this is what I wanna find, right? Initial velocity of the projectile. That means I wanna find VI with from this, you know, components, VIX squared plus VIY squared. That's how I'm gonna find that. That means my goal will be to find X and Y components. And then so I can find the magnitude. Now, what I'm given here is this taking a t equals zero, x initial and y initial to be zero, then I have x final as 195 meters, y final as 135 meters, time as 6.6 .6 seconds, and then our regular, you know, ay equals negative g and ax equals zero. Those information. And I wanna find what is V initial in terms of its magnitude? All right. That means our goal to find V initial will be from this equation, right? V initial X squared plus V initial Y squared. So that means our goal will be to find the initial velocity components. That means I have to break down my motion into two dimensions. Let's say two separate dimensions, right? Find initial X and initial Y. To let's first find V I X. All right, so remember for Vix, I have just one equation, delta x over t. And I can easily do that. Delta x is 195 meters, t is 6.6 .6 seconds, and I'm done with this. It's 21.55 meters. All right, I have half of what I need. Well, how about the other one? Well, the other one here is this. I need V initial in the y direction. Okay, how do we get that? Well, and then there, there are equations, right? So remember, V final Y equals V initial Y minus GT. 
y final equals y initial plus v initial y t minus one half g t square. V final y square equals V initial y square minus two G delta y. And then delta, delta y equals V final y plus V initial y over two times T. All right, so I'm repeating all of this so much so that you guys basically engraved in your brain. So like, let's say you guys remember this in your sleep. All right, so then here's what I have. Remember equation one, two, three, and four. That's how I kind of call them. I want VI initial. And you can see right there, I have VI initial in every single ex you know, equation over there. But can I use any of those? Well, remember, I have time and acceleration. So in this equation, if this is unknown, it has to be the only unknown. But I don't have this guy. Well, the same thing is here. If I have this, I cannot have this unknown, but I don't have that. And again, I don't have two unknowns of that. That means the only equation I can use is equation two. And that's what we end up using. Y final equals Y initial plus V initial times minus one half GT square. So Y final is 135, Y initial zero plus V initial times 6.6 minus then 4.9 times 6.6 .6 squared. Okay, so then technically in a way, sometimes what I do, I find the expression. So this is zero, then y final equals the initial time minus one half gt squared, for example, right? Then I rearrange where then, you know, I take the initial time in one side and everything else in the other side. So then it's gonna be then y final plus one half gt square, then just divide both sides by time. Okay. And then I have that equation for y final, uh, for v initial, and then plug in. So v initial is equals to 135 minus four, uh, plus 4.9 times 6.6 .6 square, divided by 6.6 .6 seconds. Calculate, we're gonna get 52.79 meters per second. Now that I have that, along with the Vx, initial x, because remember this is Viy, I can then go back and use this to find V initial. V initial is equals to square root of 29.55 squared plus 52.79 squared, and I'm gonna get 60 meters per second. That's my initial velocity magnitude. Well, how about direction? Remember, it says find the initial velocity, magnitude and direction. Then theta, you know, initial, right, will be inverse tangent of y over x. So 52.79 over 29.55. Then we're gonna get theta initial of 61 degrees. And that's my answer for this problem. That means it was launched around 60 meter per second at 61 degrees in order to go and land like that. Okay. All right. Okay, go back. So the next concept that we have is a uniform circular motion. So this one takes into account the object that actually can change the direction too. And Uniform circular motion means that, for example, if you have an object with moving with some velocity, or let's say five meter per second, thing like this, you're looking at object motion from above, from a bird eye view, and an object moving like this, but then it basically turns like this, then here it's moving, but still at five meter per second, and then turns like this and moving again, five meter per second, and then here again, five meter per second, and again, five, that means it goes around like this at five meter per second, constant speed, but it's going around, you know, in a circle. And since it's going around in a circle, changing velocity, and it is changing velocity because direction is changing, that means there's acceleration. All right, so let me, let me give you sort of like what I, you know, um, what you can see in terms of acceleration, things like this. So here's the object with this velocity. 
Remember we said, if there is an acceleration in the same direction as the velocity, then, sorry, then you basically change your speed, right? Okay, and this is true. So we think of it like this, acceleration has two parts to that. One is a parallel acceleration. Another one is, we're gonna see that it's a perpendicular acceleration. See, this is then a parallel, and this is in terms of velocity, parallel or perpendicular relative to velocity. So this is parallel to the velocity. So this guy changes speed. And that's why, it's, let's say, if acceleration right now is parallel to the velocity, you're gonna speed up. If it's in the opposite direction, you're gonna slow down, but changes the speed. So that means this guy all, you know, gonna change his speed going in a you know, straight line. But you can also have another acceleration that is perpendicular to that, to the velocity. This acceleration then, what it does, it changes direction. And only direction. Due to this particular acceleration, then instead of let's say speeding up or slowing down, instead of slowing, speeding up or slowing down, the object can actually change direction and move like this, okay? So that's why, for example, here, I had this acceleration perpendicular, so it moved like that. Here, there's an acceleration perpendicular, so it moved like this. Perpendicular acceleration here, perpendicular acceleration over there, you can see, right? At any time, acceleration is perpendicular to velocity vector. And this, basically, acceleration, responsible for changing direction. So that means you have acceleration, perpendicular, and parallel, each one does different things. One changes speed, the other one changes direction. You can have acceleration that basically changes both at the same time, or maybe acceleration that changes one at a time, okay? But in any case, what we have here is, we assume that right now, if you have a uniform circular motion, Uniform implies that speed doesn't change. That means my acceleration has zero parallel, but you know, some kind of perpendicular. That's why speed doesn't change, but direction changes. And you can see that if you wanna find the direction of this acceleration, this acceleration perpendicular, right, is you know, pr pr you know, proportional to the change in velocity, which let's say if you go from A to B, change in velocity actually happened to be in that direction. And that means that's the acceleration. Here it's in this direction, here it's in that direction. And you can see the pattern here as well. See all of those perpendicular acceleration pointing toward the center. And that's what we have. This type of acceleration always point toward the center and it's always perpendicular to the path of the motion. Okay, so always perpendicular or always points toward the center. So this is known as then as a centripetal acceleration or central, centripetal means center seeking acceleration or you know, always pointing toward the center. And the magnitude of this acceleration is given by speed squared divided by the radius. That means C for the centripetal acceleration, right? AC equals speed squared divided by the radius. Then what is then, how about the parallel acceleration? Well, this is also sometimes known instead of parallel, we can call it T for tangential acceleration because it's tangent, right? Tangent to the velocity vector. So what is the equation for this guy that changes the speed? Well, we have seen this before as well. It's dV dt, right? So this one is to change the speed. This one is to change the direction. All right, so the direction of the centripetal acceleration vector is always changing to stay directed toward the center of the circle of motion. All right. So now, one new thing that we're gonna learn here is um, just a different name for the time. So we call it period. Because for example, if you're here, if the object is here moving, but then it goes around in a circle and then comes back to the same position, right? Then in a way you can see, right, it completed one cycle on one round rotation. So then how long did it take to go around and come back here so that the time, right, for one cycle 
is defined as period. Period. So we use capital T for that. So it's the time interval required for one complete revolution or one you know, cycle. Okay. Then one of the things we have here is this. Remember equation for the speed. Speed, which I'm going to use as V for that. Remember what was the equation? It was distance over time. Distance over time. Now, if I have this as a unit circle, if I start from here and I go around and come back, that's a linear distance that I'm covering. But how much distance is that if let's say I take R to be the radius of the circle? Hopefully you guys remember that if you complete one full cycle or one full revolution, that distance is known as the circumference of the circle. And usually represented capital C, circumference. And divided by time it takes to go around in a cycle, but that distance is the circumference and the time for one circumference and then one period, capital T. But the question is, what is the equation for circumference? And hopefully you remember that this is two pi times the radius. That means the speed is equal to two pi times the radius as a distance divided by the time for one cycle, which is then the period. And if I rearrange this, I'm gonna get then two pi r over the speed. And that's what this equation is for the, for the period, okay? That means whenever you're going around in a circle, you can then have something like this, right? So basically there is an acceleration, which is speed square over the radius, but there's also the equation for, you know, uh, speed, you know, from the different point of view, from basically how much distance you cover and how long does it take to cover, let's say, you know, one cycle. In this case, period equals two pi r over the speed or the speed equals two pi r over the period. So that you, either one can be, can be used. So then as you could see here, right? So I have this acceleration as tangential that changes speed and I called it radial, but you know, it's same as centripetal. Remember, centripetal or radial, they're same thing because radial means that along the line that connects the object with the center, which is basically also centripetal. Again, tangential is the dv dt. Radial is negative of the centripetal technically because thing like this. So if here's the object, right? If here's the object, this is the center. So you do radial like this, right, in this direction. But then the centripetal is pointing in this direction. So technically radial and centripetal have opposite signs. Okay, but technically they represent, you know, same, same thing in terms of like, let's say the acceleration that changes direction. Okay, and it's, you know, speed square over R. Most of the time we just use absolute value and it's just basically, we ask you to find the radial or centripetal acceleration magnitude, which is always speed square divided by the radius. All right, so then here's an example. Um, as their booster rockets separate, uh, space shuttle astronauts typically feel acceleration up to 3G, which means three times, you know, this acceleration due to gravity, where G is 9.8 meter per second square. In their training, astronauts ride in a device where they experience such an acceleration as a centripetal acceleration. So that's why they get, go, go through a very rigorous training. Specifically, the astronaut is fastened securely at the end of a mechanical arm, which then turns at a constant speed in a horizontal circle. Okay, so basically, in a horizontal circle, it means like this. Okay. Because compared to that, there's also a vertical circle, which is like that. This is kind of like the two, you know, along the x-axis, right? Determine the rotation rate in revolutions per second, that means in how many revolutions each second does it complete? That means how many times it goes around each second. So it could be one revolution per second, or it could be many, many revolutions per second, right? So required to give an astronaut a centripetal acceleration of 3G while the circular motion with a radius of 9.45 meters. All right, so here's what I have. We are given acceleration technique, right? It's 3G which means three times 9.8 meter per second square, right? So that's our acceleration. 
Then what I have here is I have equation for centripetal acceleration, which is speed squared divided by the radius. And we are given the radius as 9.45 meters. Then I can use this to solve for speed, which is then square root of centripetal acceleration times radius. Then speed is equals to square, square root of three times 9.8 times 9.45. So we're gonna get 16.7 meters per second. All right, now each revolution, right? Then that astronauts undergoes over a distance of Q pi R, remember, which is one cycle. Remember, that means each cycle that the, you know, it undergoes like this, right? Each, each time it goes around one time, that distance, right? Remember, we call it circumference is two pi times R. So two pi times 9.45 meters, which is end up being 59.4 meters. So that's each revolution, right? Each distance of each revolution. Then what I have here is then it goes 16.7 uh, meters each second. So I take this 16.7 meters each second when one revolution here is 59.4 meters for one revolution. And you can see meters cancel out. And what we're gonna get here is 0.281 revolution, because this as a unit survives, revolution per second. And that's basically the, you know, what it was asking, right? How many revolutions per second? Because we know that each revolution is 59.4 meters. So then if you go in is 16.7 meters each second, you just multiply them to get revolutions per second. Right? And that's what we have in this example. All right, so then what we have here is an example where object can move around like this, right? Where it's kind of like moves such a way that you can take some parts of the motion to be kind of like nearly circular, right? And use those parts, for example, for some you know analysis, right? But this represents, for example, see this acceleration, that's the two-dimensional acceleration, which means there's a tangential component and a centripetal component or radial component, which means that if you have both, then you speed up and change the direction. And then here you have tangential over there, accelerate radial here, that this is accelerate. Now you're gonna slow down and change the direction. Here tangential, same direction as a, you know, motion, radial perpendicular, so you again change direction and speed up. That means whenever you have two dimensional acceleration, means that you have components, both in you know, parallel and perpendicular direction, which means it's gonna change the speed and change the direction. That means you have to kind of like take that into account. So here, here uh, we have an example here which we can you know, see some of those things. So figure below represents the total acceleration of a particle moving clockwise in a circle over radius 2.5 meters at a certain instant of time. That means this is kind of like some some of the instantaneous values. For that instant, find the radial acceleration of the particle, the speed of the particle, and its tangential acceleration. All right, so here's what we get. We're given the radius, 2.5, and I'm given acceleration 15.5, 15 meter per second square. I'm given theta it makes with respect to the normal, basically with respect to the line connecting the particle and the center. All right, so, and I'm asked, we are asked to find, so remember, so this is, let's say this is A, which is AR plus AT, right? And we are told that magnitude of this guy here is 15 meter per second square. Okay. Now, I take that vector and I break it down into two components, which is parallel or perpendicular, right? So AR and AT. And I can see that AR, which is basically the same as AC, I can use absolute value again, is a vector that is technically, right, technically uh, adjacent to this triangle, if I'm making this triangle. That means this is equals to A cosine of theta, right? Because if I break this down, right, so let's say if I move the tangential here, 
AC and AT, right? AC is the adjacent to that triangle. And we're given this as 15 meter per second square, then times cosine of 30, and I can find this to be 13 meter per second square. That's my centripetal acceleration, which is radial, right, part A. Then it's asking, what is the speed? Well, now that I have that, I know that centripetal acceleration is speed squared divided by radius. Rearrange, and then speed equals to AC times R, which is square root of 13 meter per second square times the radius of 2.5 meters. I can calculate this to be 5.7 meter per second. All right, about part B, uh, sorry, part C, which is the tangential acceleration. Well, there are a number of ways we can do that, right? So let's say, uh, but for, for this particular case, we're not given, you know, we know that this equation here is a T, sorry, equals dV dt. Okay, but we're not given any velocity function, which is given instantaneous velocity at that instant. So what do we do here? Well, use this equation. Because remember, that equation means that acceleration is the hypotenuse of the triangle that it makes with the tangential and centripetal acceleration. It means a square equals ac square plus at square. Then I can see right then at is equals to a square minus ac square in the square root. And I can solve that because I have a, which is 2.5, never mind, my bad, 15 meter per second square, then squared, then minus AC squared, which is, we just calculated 13 meter per second square squared. Calculate the tangential acceleration to be 7.5 meter per second square. There, that's the answer for this. All right, so one more example, a ball on the end of a string is whirled around the hor in a horizontal circle of radius 0.3 meters. The plane of the circle is 1.3 meter above the ground. Okay, that means, think like this. So you have a ball at the end of a string. So this is the center. And it kind of goes like this. So this is my way of representing horizontal, you know, let's say circle. And let's say this is taking the ground. We're saying that, you know, this is 1.2 meters from the ground to that point. Then the string breaks and the ball lands two meter horizontally away. Let's do this then. Maybe like, let's say we can make it, uh, maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe here. It really doesn't really matter, right? So here, like, let's say when it breaks, it then gonna, you know, kind of land like this. After that it becomes free fall, right? One point two meters, like that. So when it breaks, it then is going to basically go and kind of land like this. Okay. Right, so with some kind of velocity, like that. Imagine right, you know, it's kind of going and then it's breaking. All right. So what do we have here? Is this? So the string again breaks and the ball lands two meter in a horizontal uh, horizontally away from the point. Uh, on the ground directly beneath the ball's location when the string breaks. That means from here to there, we have two meters distance. Okay. Find the radial acceleration of the ball during its circular motion. All right, so then how do we find radial acceleration? Okay. Remember, we are given that there's a you know, radius of 0.3 meters, okay? And radial acceleration, right, is speed squared divided by radius. I have the radius, but I don't have the speed. And the speed is this guy over here that is going around initially. But after it breaks, then it's gonna be moving with this speed and falling to the ground. That means you basically have problem that combines two of the concepts we learned in this chapter. Circular motion, once you break the, you know, the, the string, then becomes a projectile, okay? Where you have 1.2 meters here, two meters over there, right? And then you can basically calculate initial velocity. With, this is basically initial velocity where launch angle here is zero degrees, which means VIX equals 
vi cosine theta, which is zero, so equals vi, and vi y equals vi sine of zero degrees equals zero. No initial velocity in a y direction. So here's then what I can do. Because I'm given y and x axis, I can then, or like y and x displacement, I can try to find a way to get the initial, okay? Because once I have the initial, then I can you know, use this equation to find the radial acceleration. Okay. And how do we do that? Well, I know that V initial equals to the X component of the velocity because there is no initial X com Y component of the velocity. So if I go back and look at V I X is equal to then Delta X over T. I have Delta X, it's two meters. But again, I don't have the time. But as you can see right from here is just basically same problem as then that the motorcycle going off the cliff. All I have to do, because I'm given the height, right? Just use this. I can say y initial is 1.2 meter, sorry. Y initial is zero. Then y final is negative 1.2 meters. A y equals 9.8, negative 9.8. A x equals zero. Basically for this portion of the problem where it's going down free fall, right? Two dimensional free fall. And then just solve for the, you know, vi x. The way I do that, I need time. How do I find time? Well, use the equation two. Y final equals Y initial plus V initial in the Y direction times time minus one half GT square. All right, so we don't, this is zero. And this is zero because initial velocity in the Y direction is zero. That means Y final is equals to negative one half GT square. Then rearrange, then time equals square root of two times negative two times y final divided by g, which becomes negative two times uh, negative 1.5, sorry, 1.2 meters, right? Y final, that means, you know, y initial, remember, we take it as zero, y final negative 1.2, and divide by 9.8 meters per second square, okay? So I find the time, okay, just plug in here and find the time. So time is 0.495 seconds. Then I come back and plug in time here, 0.495 seconds, and solve for the VIX, which is 4.04 meter per second. Now, what do I do with that? I move this into this equation and solve for the radial speed, a uh, radial acceleration, which is 4.04 square divided by 0.3 meters for the radius. And then we can find the acceleration. And here's this acceleration is 54.4 meter per second square. There you go. Kind of a mess all over, around, all over the place, right? But, you know, hopefully you guys can follow and then I have a solution in the slide anyways. All right. So you can see, right, that sometimes the problem can involve two concepts. You have to then understand and be able to break it down into two portions, right? Use this to find then the initial velocity, right? At which the ball is moving around by using the projectile concept and then use that, you know, to solve for the radial acceleration. All right, so the last thing is kind of like a long chapter. So the last thing what we have here is um, a relative motion. So this is basically to show that there is no such thing as, you know, relative velocity, right? So that means a relative position. Because for example, as I mentioned right now, if I'm sitting on my chair, my position is relative depending which reference point I'm using. Or let's say, thing like this. If I have the, the wall to the right of me, then my position is, let's say, half a meter with respect to that wall. Imagine if there's a person over there, that person would, would measure my position to be half a meter. But that was relative to him or her. Another person may, maybe on the other wall, right, on the other side of the room, would measure my position to be, let's say eight meters, no, that's a lot. But maybe like, let's say five meters. Which one is correct? Well, both of them are correct because they're measuring relative to their own position, right, as a reference. So that's kind of what we have, thing like this. So we have two observers, A and B, along the number line. So observer A is located at the origin. Observer B is at X equals negative five. Okay, X A equals negative five. So we donate the, we de, uh, denote the position variable as XA because observer A is at the origin of the 
of this axis. Both, the absorb, both observers then measure the position of P, which is this point, right? Which is located at XA equals plus five, relative to the origin again. Now, and it's exactly what I was saying, right? So then what I have here is this. So the supposed absorber B decides that he is, a loca he is located at the origin of its own coordinate system, right? That means saying, you know what? Where I stand is, my, is that reference. And then position P, right? That point P is 10 meters away from me. So I'm gonna measure that position as plus five, uh, sorry, plus 10. Okay. And observer A then claims point P is located at the position of a value of, uh, should be plus five. Okay, so plus five, which is, you know, to the right of observer A. Now, who is correct and who is wrong? Well, again, both of them are correct. You know, they have different measurements, right? One says the position of P is plus five meters. The other one says plus 10 meters. But, you know, because they are using their own, let's say, position as a reference. And, you know, basically measuring, let's say, the position P correctly, but with respect to their own, let's say, reference frame. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's kind of what we have. That means there is no such thing as absolute position, and there is no such thing as absolute motion, let's say, absolute velocity. For example, consider two observers watching a man walking on a moving beltway at an airport. The woman standing on the moving beltway sees the man moving at a normal walking speed. So let's say, I'm gonna say this is one, this is two, this is three. Person one, two, and three, right? And let's say do this. Uh, beltway moving at the speed of three meters per second, for example, right? Beltway moving at the speed of three meters per second. Okay, now, so technically then, what we measure here, the velocity of the beltway to be three meters per second is relative to this observer one, right? Person one, because when the person one is standing there, she sees the beltway moving at three meters per second. But for example, if you talk about person two, for the person two, actually, you know, she's standing there, right? For, with respect to her, both ways is not moving, okay? Because we can say that she is moving at the same speed as both way, right? So then, you know, she is not moving. But then what is the speed of person two relative to the person one, okay? Where is velocity of two relative to velocity one? Well, because she's standing on the beltway and beltway moving at three meter per second, then you can say that she's also moving at three meter per second, but only relative to the person one. Then what I have here is that person three is moving on the beltway, right? So let's say it's moving at, you know, a one, uh, let's say two meters per second. So two meter per second. But what is that speed? Is that speed relative to what? So that's the thing. All of those velocities are relative. Okay, that means I have to make it clear which velocity relative to which observer I'm actually giving. So then here's what I'm going to do then. I'm going to say then, you know, a beltway is basically my, since it's moving the same speed as my observer two, so let's say beltway is two. So let's say, I can say that this is velocity of two, which is the, you know, a person two and beltway moving at the same speed. This is velocity of two, but the relative to one which is observer one, velocity of two relative to observer one. And that's how I make this, you know, let's say notation. V two, velocity of two relative to one is three meters per second, okay? Then what will be then velocity of one relative to two? So let's say if the person two looks at person one, what will be the speed of person one relative to person two? Well, person one will see that, you know, person two moving in the opposite because she, she can say, you know what, I'm not moving. She is moving in the opposite direction. So this will be negative three meters per second. That means if the velocity of two relative to one is three meter per second, then velocity of one relative to two is then negative three meter per second. All right, so then when I say that person three is walking at three meter per second, 
Well, what am I referencing that with respect to? So let's do this then. I can say this is velocity of three relative to two is three meters, sorry, two meters per second. That means relative to the person who's also on the beltway, person two, sorry, person three is moving at two meter per second. That's why velocity of three relative to two. The question here is now this, what is then velocity of three relative to one? How fast do you think person three is moving relative to person one? Hmm? Well, probably most of you will use intuition, right? Use basic logic and figure out that it is moving at, you know, sorry, it is moving at five meter per second. All right, so if you thought of that, you are correct, okay? But one of the things we wanna do here is this, how did we get that? How do we get that, let's say, uh, precisely? And let's say, how do we get, for example, what is velocity of, you know, one relative to three or something like that? So here's then what we do. There is a notation that we can use, for example, right? So, and this always includes one, two, and three, let's say three objects kind of together. So let's say you have this, right? One, two, and three. So if I'm using, and if I'm trying to find velocity of three relative to two, or let me see this. So I was actually doing this, right? Velocity of three relative to one. So this is what I was trying to find, velocity of three relative to one. Then what I can calculate here is to be this. If I wanna find velocity of three relative to one, first, this equation ends up being the sum of two other velocities. So plus velocity, two other velocities, adding two other velocities. But the notations are important. See this first subscript of the, you know, equation on the left side, this quantity on the left side, ends up being the first subscript of the first velocity, you know, on the right side, becomes three. And then this, you know, second subscript becomes then the very last one of the second one, one, okay. And then the, let's say the subscript that I have, right? So let's say, let me make sure that like this, right? So this is goes like that over there. So then how about here? The, you know, the first one for the second term and the second one for the first term on the right side. Well, what we do over there, we use the one that you don't find over here. See, on the left side, the quantity I'm calculating, that means velocity of three relative to one, doesn't include the second absorber. That means here for where I have, you know, question marks, then I use this. So that means velocity of three relative to one equals then velocity of three relative to two plus velocity of then two relative to one. And then their sum will give me then equation for the, or the quantity for the velocity of three relative to one. Might be confusing in the beginning, but let's try again. For example, what is velocity of two relative to three? Well, it will be velocity of, first you write down two, right? Because the first subscript should be there. And then the next one for this term should be the one that is not part of that combination here. That means velocity of two relative to three equals velocity of two relative to one, then plus velocity of, so that you repeat one relative to then move the last one here, two, three, okay, makes sense? So this is two, three, that means this has to be two, one, this is then one, three, because the first one and the first term and the second one, the you know, second term on the right side should match the subscript that you have on the left side of the equation. Then let's do this, let's use this equation to calculate that. What is velocity of, velocity of three relative to one? Well, it says velocity of three relative to two which we have here, velocity of three relative to two, remember it was two meters per second, then plus velocity of three relative to one. Well, velocity of three relative to one was three meter per second, so then three meter per second, and we end up then five meter per second. That's how we calculate that. So that means you don't have to guess, you can actually calculate that, all right? All right, so then, uh, so again, so here what we have is that the basic idea for this one was the woman standing on the moving beltways is the man moving at a normal walking speed. The woman absorbing from the stationary floors is the man moving at with a higher speed. 
five meter per second rather than two meter per second because the beltway speed combines with his walking speed. So then both observers look at the same man and arrive at different values for his speed. But both are correct because the difference in their measurement results from the relative velocity of their frames of reference. So it means each one, you know, uses different frame of reference so that they get different values. So that's why there's no such thing as absolute velocity. It's relative velocity. So for example, right now I'm sitting, but I'm sitting relative to somebody in my own room. But you know, we all know that let's say earth is moving, right? That means I'm actually moving with earth. So I'm, rel I'm, I'm at rest relative to someone in my room, but for someone who's in a space station, right? Outside of earth, they see me moving, not, not, not in our international space station, because it's also moving with earth, but let's say some aliens, I don't know, some aliens, right? So looking at us, they will see me moving with earth. That means I am moving relative to them. I am at rest relative to someone in my room. All right. That ones, you know, all of them are correct because their measurement is, you know, with respect to their own reference frame. Okay. Anyway, so here's then what I had. So like, let's say this is, you, you know, for the velocity, you can see, right? So what you have here is this. So you have P, A, and B. So three different, you know, observers, for example. And if I want to find speed of the P relative to A, then you can see that I have to add two other velocities vector together. One P relative to B plus then B relative to A. And again, you can see, right, the subspeed was like this. So the P is the, oops, sorry. P is the first one uh, you know, in, the, in the first term and A is the last one on the second term. And then the one that on the inside part, right, those are for the third, you know, let's say observer, okay. So these ones are known as Galilean transformation equations, okay. They basically can be for one dimensional or two dimensional. They can work either, you know, pretty much either way, okay. They can work pretty much either way. So if it's two dimensional, you, do, you don't have to treat, you then have to treat this as two dimensional vector addition, okay. When it's one dimensional, you can then just algebraically add them together. All right, so let's see this example then. It's like the last example. All right, so, all right, so Hackfin walks at the speed of seven meter per second across his, across his raft. That is, he walks perpendicular. So let's say here what we have, right? We have a raft that is uh, moving, let's say with the river, okay? So that means he walks perpendicular to the raft's motion relative to the shore. The raft is traveling down the Mississippi River at the speed of 1.5 meter per second relative to the river bank. What is the Hack's velocity, speed and direction relative to the river bank? That means let's say you have somebody here, right? Some observer here looking at his relative velocity. Okay. Now what we're given here is there is a velocity of the river current, which basically same as the, you know, the raft velocity. So technically then we have three things, right? So they have, let's say, we have, uh, let's say a raft. So let me see, do I, do I have, okay. So let's say I have uh, three things. So let's say I have velocity and I have, um, I guess I'm gonna use H for the, for hack and I'm gonna use um, R for raft and I'm gonna use B for bank. Okay, so let's say this is B the bank where this, this one person here is, right? And it's gonna observe and the R for the raft, which is basically moving at the same speed as a river, right? So this is basically, uh, let's say velocity of the, let's say, you know, a, a raft relative to the shore, right? Or relative to the, uh, to the bank, okay? And this is basically 1.5 meter per second. And then what I have here is this velocity here is velocity of hack relative to the, to the raft, right? Relative to the raft, which is 0.7 meter per second. Then what is the velocity of the hack relative to the bank? That's the question. Now, what, what I do here is this, here's the equation velocity of hack relative to the bank will be equals to, and remember, what, what we do here is this, velocity of, move this here to hack, relative to the third one, which is raft, then plus 
velocity of then you move this here raft right relative to then bang like that so that's my equation so then what i have is this this equation gives me so velocity of hack relative to raft is 0.7 meter per second but this is j hat plus velocity of raft relative to bank is 1.5 meter per second i hat i had j hat i can add them algebraically but then one thing i can do here i know that those are the components so i can say then say okay velocity of hack relative to the bank is square root of 0.7 square plus 1.5 square and i get 1.66 meter per second so it means it, it will be moving at 1.66 meter that means this guy measures the speed of hack to be 1.66 meter per second but in which direction is, is he's he moving well we can then use inverse tangent of then um, 0.7 over 1.5 and we get 25 degrees that means see if i use a parallelogram method right we can see that then this resultant velocity of you know of the hack is like this that means the raft is moving to the right hack is moving up sort of like say and then observer then what it sees the you know hack moving basically in this direction rather than you know let's say you know in a j hat direction because as as a as hack moving in a j hat direction raft is moving to the right so his relative motion relative the, the hack's motion relative to let's say uh, a bank will be 1.66 at the 25 degree angle all right guys so that's it for this chapter